Good morning. On behalf of the congregation of the First Presbyterian Church, I want to welcome each of you to worship with us this morning. I invite you to sign the, oops, I was going to say ritual friendship cards, the, uh, the welcome to worship cards. Uh, please place them in the offering plates at the end of the worship service that we can contact trace if, God forbid, we have to do that. Uh, please take note of the announcements that are printed in your bulletin inserts. I want to mention that the Presbyterian Women's mission focus for November is our own church's food pantry. Details about that are printed. Uh, the deacons will be selling poinsettias for sanctuary decorating up until December 1st. It starts next Sunday. Poinsettias, of course, uh, would be for our, uh, our, our Christmas, for the season of Advent and Christmas. Uh, the Presbyterian women will be having their, their usual bake sale uh, for the presidential election. We are a polling place uh, on November 3rd. It'll be set up. Please drop donations off by Monday the 2nd. Uh, the 2020 Advent devotional booklet theme will be Jesus, our Savior, Shepherd, and Redeemer. Articles can be submitted by anyone from ministers to uh, Stephen ministers to uh, congregation officers, whatever. So uh, please get that in by November 13th. Uh, the WINS Project, Weekend Nutrition for Students, wants to send peanut butter and graham crackers home, graham crackers home uh, with children for Thanksgiving, Easter, uh, and Christmas. So please uh, take note of that. We need to stock up. Uh, I want to mention also the little uh, insert for the nominating committee. Please uh, submit your friends or your enemies for uh, elder, deacon, or trustee. Uh, that's your call. Uh, this Sunday, uh, the 25th, of course, the third option by Miles McPherson will be the topic for our Christian education, our adult Christian education program. Uh, also, if you're experiencing pandemic fatigue, the Stephen ministers are available. And note also uh, that today is Reformation Sunday. Have a nice little article about Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who was, of course, part of the Reformation. I believe that concludes my portion of the announcements for this morning. My wife has a minute for mission from the uh, committee, the Christian Education Committee. Good morning. So this morning I'm going to speak about a new mission project, sort of a new mission project. We've had a project here before with a small group. Um, it's the Operation Christmas Child. So we at First Press are looking to assist in the efforts of the Samaritan's Purse this year by helping with Operation Christmas Child, a charity effort that fills shoe boxes with toys, gifts, and love for those less fortunate than ourselves. A number of years ago, as I mentioned, our small group started this little project in, within themselves, and uh, we're wanting to extend it out to you. The idea is simple. You fill a box provided by the ministry outreach along with a list of items accepted to fill the box. So the box comes like this, um, and it has some instructions as to how to put the box together. But the nice thing about it is on one of the inside flaps of the shape of the box is the ideas of possible gifts that you could pack inside. And um, there is uh, also some directions if you want to take care of some shipping online, which I'm going to get to right now. Each box will also cost $9 in postage as they're going overseas. We ask that if you are packing a box that you cover the cost of shipping as well if possible. They will also include, you can also include a check if you'd like inside the box uh, to cover the postage for the shipment. Boxes will become available in the church office starting tomorrow, but we have a couple that are already put together here in the front pew. The deadline for this ministry is November 15th, and when your boxes are packed, just bring them back here before that date, and we'll get them to where they need to go for shipping. So that's all I have for you.
think I know how to use my mask by now. <laughs> Please join with me in the call to worship taken from Psalm 139, um, as is printed in your bulletins this morning. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. We give thanks to you, God, our Father, for the mercy that reaches out, for patience that waits for our return, for love that is always ready to welcome us and bring us home. You are faithful and you are kind. Today, we join together with each other as your church to declare your praise and to worship you and you alone. For we know that you alone are worthy of praise. This morning, we gather to give you the glory, laud, and honor. Fill this place with your spirit. Give us eyes to see your presence, ears to hear your will in our lives, and a voice to lift your name alone on high. Amen. The scriptures tell us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, yet we are justified by the gift of God's grace through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Please join with me in the prayer of confession as found in your bulletin. Eternal God, our judge and our redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and turned from our neighbors. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your mercy, O oh God, forgive us our sin and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to take a moment of silence to confess your sins before God. Hear the good news. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. As we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Friends, believe the good news of the Gospels. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love and strength to follow on the path you set before us. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Our first Old Testament lesson for today is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 13, verses 1 through 6, which is the entirety of Psalm 13. This psalm is entitled, Prayer for Deliverance from Enemies. Hear the word of the Lord. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is the word of the Lord. I want to come over here so you can see. I have a demonstration. Rose, you can come up too. So, you'll notice I have three things here. I have this pan. Claire, if you could hold that. What do you note about that pan? Is it light? Is it heavy? Pretty heavy? All right, and then Owen, if you want to hold this. Don't spill it, I'm trusting you. Cool. All right, you guys want to come over here so that people can see what you're holding? Excellent, excellent. So, Owen, what's inside here? They can't really see it. What's in here? Water. water? So this is water and that's water, right? So can you verify that these are the same thing? Excellent, excellent. Rose, you want to come over here so you can see? All right, what's in there, water? Yeah, don't touch it, don't touch it. All right, cool. I don't know what I thought was going to happen. All right, so Claire, can you, is there anything in there? Is it empty? It's completely, it's completely empty. Okay, go ahead and put it in the water. And what happens? It's heavy. But it's heavy. It's a big, heavy, big pan. Why is it, why is it floating? Because the bottom is spread out. Because the bottom is spread out and because it's empty, right? Now, I want you to think of this pan as us, okay? We're empty vessels, okay? Whenever we're born, we grow, and as we grow, we fill ourselves with stuff, right? Knowledge, experiences. Well, thanks, George, for the hug. We fill ourselves with stuff. Now, Owen, I want you to take that water, and I want you to dump it in there. Perfect. What did you notice about the pan as you filled it with water? It sunk. That's right. Now, earlier I said that the stuff in the pan, in the, or in the, in, the, in the big pan, and what you were holding in the jar or pitcher were both the same thing, right? So if we think of this pan as us immersing ourselves in the world, but we're empty vessels, we're good to still float, right? as long as the stuff of the world stays on the outside of the boat, on the outside of the pan. But as soon as you filled the pan with the stuff of this world, what happened to it? It sunk. And that's the same way that we are as empty vessels. When the troubles and the things of the world are allowed to come inside of us, 
we sink. But as long as we can remain hollow and fill ourselves instead with the Holy Spirit, we'll stay floating. We know the story of Jesus as he's walking on the water. Peter comes out and wants to walk with his Lord. And what happens when he takes his eyes off of Jesus? He sinks. As soon as he loses his focus and looks again to the things of this world, he sinks. So if we can learn anything from this example, it's to keep our focus on Jesus, to let the bad things of the world stay on the outside and be in the world, but not of it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this example and this analogy. We thank you for the story of Peter walking on the water. And we thank you for your love and your deliverance. And then we pray. Amen. Thanks, Owen. Thanks, everybody. You can go sit down again. Our second Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verses 8 through 13. Listen for the word of God. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Yes, all who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear. I will help you. May the Lord bless your understanding these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Once upon a time, not so very long ago, a wealthy man died and promptly went to heaven. He was met at the pearly gates by none other than St. Peter himself. Peter said to the man, Welcome to heaven. Let me show you where you'll be staying for all eternity. Peter then escorted the man past one spectacular mansion after another. Finally, they reach an old, dilapidated shack at the end of the street. Here it is, Peter said. This is where you're going to be spending the rest of eternity. The man was stunned. He looked at Peter and said, Why do I have to spend eternity in this rickety old shack when all these other people get to live in spectacular mansions? Peter looked right at the man and said, Well, sir, we did the very best we could with what you sent us. That's my stewardship plug for the day. As Jesus would say, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Then there's one about the HMO insurance agent who went to heaven. After standing in line for hours, he finally reached the front of the line. St. Peter was taking the role. Name, Peter said to the man, the man uttered his name. Occupation, Peter said to the man. The man said, I was an HMO insurance agent on earth. Is that what you mean? Peter said, ah, yes, here you are. Then he added, you can come in, but you can only stay for three days. I tell those stories for a very important reason. They present rather hopeless situations do they not? In fact, I think we could call these hopeless situations the product of Saturday thinking. What is Saturday thinking? It's a term I heard used by Dr. Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament professor at the Columbia Theological Seminary. Saturday thinking, he said, is hopeless thinking. Dr. Brueggemann explained it this way. 
Jesus Christ was crucified on Good Friday. That was a dark and devastating day for his disciples. Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter Sunday. That was a day that featured a tremendous restoration of hope for his disciples. That Saturday in between, however, the disciples had endured the devastation of the crucifixion, but had not yet encountered the hope of the resurrection. That's Saturday thinking. It's an aimless kind of wandering between devastation and hope. It's a weary soul that has undergone tremendous upheaval and does not yet know what the future holds. Our lives are filled with Saturday thinking. Picture the woman whose husband has left her after 20 years of marriage. She feels as though her heart has been wrenched from within her. Her world is in a shambles and she doesn't know where to turn. That's Saturday thinking. Picture the man who feels as though he's been put out to pasture by a forced early retirement. His job was his identity for nearly 40 years. Now his world is in a shambles and he doesn't know where to turn. That's Saturday thinking. Picture the college student who dreamed of becoming an engineer. Then she encountered calculus. She could not get through calculus. She got booted out of the engineering program at school and her life's dream went up in a puff of smoke. Her world in a shambles and she doesn't know where to turn. That's Saturday thinking. Picture the little boy who loves his mother and father. Yet it seems as if no matter what he does, he gets roundly criticized. They yell at him. They beat on his self-esteem until finally there's nothing left. Now his friends are getting involved with drugs and he figures he might just as well get involved with drugs as well. His world is in a shambles and he doesn't know where to turn. That's Saturday thinking. Now, Saturday thinking in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's more like an aimless wandering. Saturday thinking is a way of thinking that is caught between devastation and hope. It needs to find its way to hope. But how? How does it come to hope? If we look carefully at the 13th Psalm, I think we uncover some Saturday thinking as well. The psalmist writes, How long, O Lord, wilt thou forget me forever? Later he adds, How must I bear this pain in my soul and sorrow in my heart all day long? What is it that devastates the psalmist so? Perhaps no one can give any of the particulars with any great degree of certainty, but it appears as though some kind of enemy has laid hold of the psalmist. He cries out to God, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. The psalmist is frightened to death. Literally. He has endured the devastating assault of his enemy, and he does not yet know quite what the future holds. He's caught in the midst of Saturday thinking. In the midst of his despair, however, he desperately pleads with God. Then notice how the 13th Psalm concludes. But I have trusted in thy steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bounteously with me. That doesn't sound like Saturday thinking at all, does it? Something dramatic has happened to completely transform the psalmist's outlook. Something profound has occurred 
to finally give him hope. But what? What happened to lift the psalmist out of the pit of despair and disorientation? The psalm has taken a significant turn. Actually, a lot of psalms take a significant turn. Unfortunately, we never seem to discover exactly what happened to change the psalmist's outlook. Never are we specifically told what brought about his spiritual healing. Clearly, however, the psalmist has given the problem over to God. Walter Brueggemann, in a book called Praying the Psalms, calls this an act of painful relinquishment. Perhaps one is reminded of that pithy old phrase, let go and let God. Yet perhaps there's more to that phrase than meets the eye. When all hope is lost, when we've nowhere left to turn, we relinquish the problem to God. We relinquish the problem to the God with whom we have a relationship, who, who, with whom we have a covenant, the God who wishes our well-being, the God who does indeed hear us, and the God who does indeed answer our most heartfelt prayers. We relinquish painfully, but what is it we really want? Patrick Miller was an Old Testament professor at the Princeton Theological Seminary. In a book called They Cried to the Lord, he suggests that what we really want is peace. Now, he defines peace as well-being, safety, and security. What we want is peace. Yet how does that come about? Miller writes, perhaps the oracle of salvation is our best indication. An oracle of salvation is a word from God that gives us peace. It puts our strife-torn souls to rest. It leads us out of the disorientation and despair at work in our lives. We see the oracle of salvation revealed to us in the 41st chapter of the book of Isaiah. God speaks to his people through the prophet Isaiah saying, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you. I will help you with my victorious right hand. Later, God adds, fear not, for I will help you. That, my friends, is the oracle of salvation. Restoration is promised, but the most profound notion in the oracle of salvation is that God is, in fact, with his people. In the words of Patrick Miller, there where the human condition is at its worst and no mortal can sufficiently help, where people are terribly frightened, God speaks the only word that matters. You don't have to be afraid. Depression, despair, and disorientation are all products of Saturday thinking. Unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic has put a lot of people in that boat. Depression, despair, and disorientation can be defined as an emotional expression of a state of helplessness or powerlessness of the ego. In other words, Something dramatic has happened to shatter one's self-esteem. Up ahead, there seems to be nothing but an abyss of hopelessness. As Willard Galen notes in a book called The Psychodynamic Understanding of Depression, the disease represents the dissipation of the reparative movements. In other words, we can't fix the problem ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, that is absolutely critical. We can't fix the problem ourselves. 
Only God can provide an oracle of salvation. But let me make one more thing perfectly clear. God has also given us brilliant people with incredible minds who have the capacity to heal the mind. Sometimes that's exactly what we need. I am not trying here to provide psychological healing for depression, despair, or disorientation. I am attempting to provide spiritual healing for depression, despair, or disorientation. There is a profound difference. Your spirit is your being or your oneness with God. Thus, spirituality has to do with drawing closer to God. Therefore, spiritual healing comes as one's spirit is brought into closer unity with the Holy Spirit of God. Are you with me? What oftentimes gets us hung up, however, is our fear. We get terribly afraid in the pit of depression or despair or disorientation and wonder if God is really there. The opposite of fear, of course, is trust. Trust lets go of things and leaves them in the hands of God. To relinquish our fears to God and hope that God will make things better is the beginning of the spiritual journey. To sense the oracle of salvation is the beginning of spiritual healing. Listen closely for relinquishment and the oracle of salvation in the words of a poem I call God Spoke. I cannot see, O Lord my God, the road that lies ahead. To fail to have control of life is something that I dread. The path can sometimes seem to wind away from where I mark, and into an abyss I fall where life is cold and dark. The loves I've had, the triumphs too, can sometimes end in pain. A fearful question comes to mind, is my life lived in vain? Then I come to what's worst of all, the pit of depression. Why has this hopelessness, I feel, become my obsession? I give it all to you right now. I have nowhere left to turn. In quiet, I will listen now to hear your voice. I yearn. The silence, it was deafening. And then a light broke through. I thought I heard the voice of God say, I will speak to you. God said, don't ever give up hope, for I do have a plan. And when you think you can't go on, I tell you now, you can. You are a child most dear to me. I want to see you cope. I gave you life, and now I'm here. I want to give you hope. I sent my son into the world, my kingdom to prepare. And that's a kingdom that's designed for you and I to share. So don't give up, never give up. Fear not, I will help you. Draw closer to me every day. My love is your rescue. God spoke, and I felt strangely warm. It was a grand repose. God spoke, and I felt quite at peace. My spirit, it arose. Our spirit is our being, or our oneness with God. Spirituality has to do with drawing closer to God. And spiritual healing comes as one's own spirit is brought into closer unity with the Holy Spirit of God. That really can happen. It happens when we encounter the oracle of salvation. God says to us, fear not, I will help you. We've got to believe that with all our hearts. If we're ever going to move beyond Saturday thinking, Amen. Please remain seated. Will you join with me in saying what we believe by way of the Apostles' Creed, which is printed in your bulletins? I believe in God of the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Deanna. Your bulletin insert for Reformation Sunday tells you about Ulrich Zwingli, and he is considered one of the founders, one of the founding fathers of faith for the Reformation. As noted, the bubonic plague was striking Europe in the 1500s, and in 1519, late in the year, it struck Zurich, his hometown. He returned to the town and assisted there, but then contracted the plague, and then after convalescing, wrote that wonderful hymn that is found in your insert. Um, our limitations are that it was originally in Latin, then transposed into Old English. The prayer this morning for Reformation Day comes from his song upon which we will use as structure for our hymn today, our prayer today. So let us turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bless your holy name. Help, Lord God, help in this trouble. We feel like death and disease is at our door. Stand before us, O Christ, for you have overcome death. You have conquered sin. You are the victor of all. Our lives are in your hands. Help us to embrace your will and purpose for us. Guide us to be faithful followers. Grant that as a church we may be a faithful witness. As the church, help us to meet the social justice, economic, and spiritual challenges of this current pandemic. May we discern your will and exhibit your wisdom. Guide us to do justice, show kindness, and walk humbly with you as our God, no matter what we experience. Console us, Lord God, console us. This illness increases. Pain, loneliness, worry, and fear seize our souls and bodies. With your grace, O Lord our God, you are our only consolation. Even in the midst of illness and restriction of body, mind, and soul, you are with us. You are our strength in the midst of weakness. In the midst of temptation, troubles, and trial, you are with us. We are not forsaken or forgotten. Give us strength to resist the influences of the evil one and his charges, for they wait like a lion crouching at our doors to pounce upon us in our vulnerability. By your mighty spirit, keep our heart's desires and spiritual hope focused on you. Speak, Lord God, speak. Give us life, we ask. Grant abundant life upon this earth as we practice necessary disciplines. Grant the confidence of eternal life as we live and move and have our being through you. By your help, dear Lord, let us grasp our spiritual reward. Joyfully, we praise you. And now, O oh Lord, we pray for the world, our country, counties, and communities. We pray for all those who serve our country in the executive, legislative, and judicial levels of government. We pray for those in our congregation who serve in the military, and we ask that you would be with their colleagues. Especially we lift to you Donald Alba, Aaron Balsamo, Scott Balsamo, Andrew Hall, Travis Jensen, Kirk Mumau, Paige Junker Ormiston, and Chloe Peterson. We pray for those who serve in mission, Ross and Mary Hunter, Reverend Celestine Muzikera, Reverend Debbie Blaine, Donnie Brake, Esther Wakeman, Milta and Ed Dudick, Andrew and Amy Funka. We pray for local missions like the Fairview Fairmont Outreach, the Community Soup Kitchen, our food pantry, Stephen Ministry, and prayer line of this church. 
Their service, O Lord, is our strength. We thank you, O Lord, for the gift of memory and love remembered. With Sandy Cupper, we remember Bob, Bob Cupper. And with Doris Miller, we remember Jan Maureen Miller and Henry Miller. You bless us with the beauty of these flowers presented to your glory this day. Lord, we lift these joys to you. Thanks be to God. We intercede for those who are ill, recovering and recuperating. Be with them as the great physician and heal, comfort and console them, especially with Chuck Bentle, Chuck Cable, Shirley Minnis, Mitzi Finton, Dan Smith, Peg Weimer and Charlie Pearsall. We pray on behalf of those who are mobility bound, living in retirement facilities, nursing homes and care facilities. Bestow your blessings of companionship, comfort, and patience while they are under restriction of the COVID pandemic. Be present to Alberta Cole, Jean Curtis, Jean Lundahl, Wilma Campbell, Becky Jordan, Paul Pearsall, Bertha Gravink, Grace Rohr, Hugh Nesbitt, Jean Bull, Marge Filliger, Jane Nelson, and also with Chuck Bentel, Mabel Giles, Ron Harned, Zane and Shirley Nozikoff, Arden Hughes, Marcy and Slater Crawford, Chuck and Janet Kohler, Patricia Swartz, and others. And if we have forgotten anyone in this prayer or in any of our prayers, O God, we ask for your grace. We know that all persons matter to you. You cherish all regardless of race, culture, class, gender, age, occupation, or vocation. Your love is greater than we can fathom. Lord, we lift these concerns to you. Lord, hear our prayer. In your mighty and holy name, we pray through Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Saturday thinking is thinking that is caught between devastation and hope. To move to hope, one must encounter the oracle of salvation, where God says to us, I am with you, I will help you. It really can happen. 
Now go in peace. I know that God our Father abides with us always. And I may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father Almighty, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.